Can we just run this? Yeah, you can sure. <laughs> you asked me to be a dis discussant. I'm not sure what it implies. <laughs> yeah, it. But, but anyways, I, I kind of, uh, of course, uh, listening to you and also I had the opportunity to read the text. I think that's a really good concept that you actually, you know, get some of these drafts and get to respond to them. And I think it's useful for me also listening to you. But um, yeah, great papers, <laughs> I think. Uh, and this sort of interest in how technology uses us and how to conceptualize the agency of technology, understand it or come to terms with it, how to exist with technology and sort of not how to quantify the self, but, but how to be a self in the presence of quantification. I think these are, I mean, really important questions. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, in as much as, as it is a story of ourselves that we see in the data, it's also sort of a, a writing that produces us. I think that, that sort of dichotomy is really interesting. And I was thinking of, you know, it's, it's spot on, but I was also thinking of how to, uh, interpreting what you, you say, how to conceptualize this in a, in, a, in, a, in a larger perspective. And I was thinking of, um, yeah, the, you mentioned, Jill, this sort of paper and writing as kind of a, oh, that's when technology was more easy. It, it didn't sort of project us back, but I was thinking that maybe paper and writing do that. And maybe that's a sign of something bigger. Uh, I was thinking of Jacques Derrida, who writes about the grammatology, uh, that, that, that writing is an externalization of consciousness. Mm. And this externalization is what also creates us as human beings. I mean, in contrast this to speech, that's normally perceived as closer to the soul. Um, and also, uh, I mean, also then writing is, is uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, then, do you want to have oh, for the video. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I, <laughs> and I was thinking also in, in a larger perspective, not writing, but Giorgio Agamben talks in continuation of Foucault about the dispositif or the apparatus. Uh, it's literally anything that in some way has the capacity to capture, or determine, or model, or control. And he uses the, also the example of the pen writing literature, but also extends this to agriculture and computers and s cell phones and why not language itself, he says. Mm. Uh, so to him, subjectivity is what, ap what appears in between the living and the apparatus. I think that's very similar to the way you think of it. Mm. Uh, so at the very fundamental level, language and writing and these... Uh, Apparatuses are not neutral, but have their own realities, and they and these realities affect how we understand and con construct ourselves. I think, I think you both point to this very nicely. Uh, these so how these systems of quantification functions as apparatuses would, or dispositives would be them. Uh, I also see this in, in in other studies of software. I was thinking first like sticking to the grammar of, uh, of Phil Agra, who talks about grammars of action and how systems like, like computers capture data. I mean, that's what they, they capture. I mean, they don't surveil us, but they capture us. And that changes our behaviors into, it changes our grammars of actions into becoming visible for capture. I mean, being at a university, it's quite obvious, you know, how, how research and education, etc., is constantly the object of capture. And also, but also Matthew Fuller in Software Studies who talks about word. I was thinking of that because of, of your text, Jill. But he says, well, word not only is not only a tool for writing; it also uh, designs its users. Mm -hmm. I mean, a particular way of of writing, particular global business like English, for instance. Um, so um, yeah. Those, yeah, I have lots of other, other things uh, to discuss. Uh, yeah, what, what the, yeah, but maybe we should start here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. 
Do you okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. No, well, many many interesting suggestions. Really, um, uh, there is one thing that I actually grabbed from your from your presentation that I think was quite interesting and connects to something I've been uh, writing about, but I couldn't really um, discuss in this presentation. I only briefly mentioned it at, at the very end, and it's the use of the of the transitive verbs in uh, in the description of how we. Uh, uh, um, engage with the quantified self and with technologies in general. So the idea of humans using technology, so a, a subject using an object. Uh, and my suggestion at the end of leaving with, as things to leave with, uh, is also uh, an option to, to try to think in terms of intransitive verbs. So can we, can we think about uh, technologies that things uh, we cohabit with, uh, that we um, dwell on? Uh, so can we think in, in terms of uh, coexistence rather than usage and influence, uh, verbs that all imply a, a transition and a, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, an action uh, upon uh, an object or a subject. Mm. So th that's because I very often notice that, particularly in relation to quantified self and gamification, uh, the, the stories that we hear are mostly about the effects of, and also about agency, for example, which implies a, a transitive verb. So it implies an action to be, uh, to, 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 that happens on someone or something. Um, but maybe maybe the, the the trick is in the verbs that we, that we use. So uh, thinking instead of uh, of uh, of uh, cohabitation or living together or uh, uh, or um, mutual influence, uh, I've also been, for example, thinking about uh, these technologies as parasites. So can we think of uh, the quantified self, uh, uh, for example, of Nike fuel as a parasite, or or ourselves as parasites of of, of these technologies? So. In terms of uh, co-living and mutual uh, uh, cohabitation, rather than using each other. Mm. There's one more. Yeah. Uh, idea. Yeah. Well, I think there's um, certainly a greater and greater level of um, equality balance between us and our technology. I mean, you can argue whether we have any agency left or not, but we're, it's certainly quite clear that there's um, some sort of shared thing going on here anyway. Um, and I, I do think it's really interesting thinking about how we're trying to imbue our technologies with subjectivity through artificial intelligence and stuff at the same time as we're trying to quantify ourself. Like there's this immensely in complex and interesting um, back and forwards happening there. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, but obviously, I mean, that also points to what you were sort of alluding at towards the end, the sort of whole discussion of post-humanism. And I was also thinking of that, reading your paper of Karen Barad's thinking, not, not that I'm so, I mean, some people really quote her a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't do that, but I find it interesting. But she also picks up actually on, on Foucault's notion of the apparatus or dispositive to understand as a way of, of sort of uh, explaining what she calls sort of this against your realism and, and and interactions between humans and technologies. I think that maybe there's something to be gained, you know, in her her thinking, and it's sort of that in, um, that 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 sort of must encourage us to think of these apparatuses as as involving processes that are that are both technical and and human at the same at the same time. And if you are to understand them, we also need to not only look at them as you know extensions of human activity but also as extensions of machine activity yes. and that how these machine activities are are and uh, I quote philosophers all the time <laughs> uh, Deleuze and Foucault uh, writes that that machines are s social are human technologies before they are technical ones so actually when we look at this, it sort of involves different steps, right? We have first, we shouldn't we shouldn't see this as a, just an extension of our own activity. We should look at the the technical processes involved. But behind the technical processes, there there's a, there are ideologies. I mean, I I, I mean, I couldn't imagine uh, the quantified self without also thinking. I think that's the topic of the next discussion after this uh, session: the neoliberal subject, the construction of a neoliberal subject. I mean, just as much as the prison constructs a different subject or whatever in, in Foucault's thinking. So I think, yeah, I think there's something to be gained in this kind of thinking. 
I'm just wondering, though, because, I mean, yes, I absolutely agree that the neoliberal, uh, which we are going to return to, uh, hugely important. But there are other examples of self-tracking. Like, like women have, I'm sure, always tracked their periods to some extent. <laughs> oh, well, all right, then. <laughs> and, um, or, you know, I, I have a friend who, I did the baby tracking on the computer, but I have a friend who does that um, on paper, and she learned it from her mother. Um, so, and these are forms of, I mean, you can trace some of that back to, uh, the, you know, the sort of um, numerical bias in, um, sorry, in, in medicine, the way that, that women's uh, care for children was like transitioned from midwives to doctors and it became more objective and more data and more machines and measure the baby, don't just, don't just look at the baby and feel it to see if it's healthy, but measure it, weigh it. Um, and that, I don't, I think, I mean, that's different from neoliberalism. Right? I mean, maybe that you can certainly say they're related, which makes me think that perhaps quantified self could have, I mean, now it's clearly very le neoliberal, a lot of it, but maybe it could have been different. And that's interesting to think about. Like, um, like you know, um, Brecht suggested that why did we make radio broadcast? Why didn't we make it a peer to peer, peer like a two way media? I mean, he said that in the 30s, and it's quite true. We could have made the technology different. So, is there a way we could think about quantified self as not neoliberal? Yeah, of course. I mean, the quantification. I mean, in, in the Roman Empire, they were obsessed with the quant quantifying stocks and state. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's as old as writing, right? <laughs> uh, keeping track of stuff. Um, but I think, but I think then the sort of construction of the subject. I mean, we should also. I mean, now we are engaging the other <laughs> panel, yeah. uh, but but also, I mean, how that's different from. Say the consumer, the consuming subject in the consumer society, as Le Favre described it, there's a control of consumption. So, for instance, to become, I mean, uh, objects don't just have like a, a use value; they also have a, a, a sign value. So, a car, for instance, is not just a car; it's also a particular brand that it, it expresses a particular kind of power and authority. And the implication of this is that if I don't have a car, I don't have that authority. And if I have a particular car, I have a particular kind of authority. And think that's sort of how sort of uh, uh, capitalism function is his pers in his perspective. But I think in, with the quantified self, it's different. It doesn't want me to consume. It doesn't want me to obey, to become a particular kind of person. It just wants to measure me. And it sort of thrives thrives on on the data that I leave, that's the value that's gained. So it's a subject that's encouraged to share and who only comes into being by sharing, by being visible. That would be my thesis. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe if I, if I can uh, <coughs> also uh, add one thing. So, uh, connected to what you were saying before about the, the, this uh, connection with the neoliberal um, uh, ideology, uh, I think the, the, the point here is really to, to try to understand what, when we talk about the knowledge that is offered by the quantified self, what, what specific kind of knowledge are we talking about? Um, and that's, I think, it's really the question. So when you, for example, were presenting the work by James Bridal, which is a, a brilliant work where uh, he, he presents uh, the, the, how uh, Google, right? How, how Google track is, how, how, is a smart, how is iPhone actually track is, is movement. And, and this idea of not remembering all the places where he has been, uh, which of course brings to the, to the conclusion that, okay, my phone knows more about me than I do. Uh, but then of course this knowledge that we are talking about, it's a quantified knowledge. It's a knowledge that can be measured in, in, in terms of more or less. Um, which uh, kind of reminded me of when I was presenting and talking about these differences by degree and different differences in kind. So it's a, it's a specific kind of knowledge that it can be quantified and therefore can be different uh, in, by, by quantity. Uh, so I can say that, for example, my phone knows more about me than I do. Uh, but it is also of a different, can, there are also knowledges of different qualities, of different kinds. So I think, the, I think the question about the quantified self-technology, if we want to somehow in think and invent other narratives, other stories about the quantified self, is to uh, think how many other knowledges uh, there can be, uh, how many other knowledges we can imagine and, and, and present and discuss and, and, and create narratives about. I think that's really the challenge uh, at this stage. Sure. Um, Some time for the yeah.
Well, yeah. there's a mic here. So, you know, you can keep that on the for this one. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions to the panel? Yes, please. I'm going to do more steps today as a result of this. Very good. Somebody should quantify that for me. Hi, I'm Phoebe Moore. Um, thanks again. Excellent papers. Really, really interesting. Um, I think what occurred to me in your discussion is what's missing from the conversation is something about method and what we rely on when we talk about quantification of, of activity and, and life is the fact that we're looking at something that's longitudinal. So that's something that's facilitated actually by the new technologies of sensory tracking. That's something that's missing in, in, in your discussion of what, make, what brings out the quality of the knowledge and the data itself. Um, and then in terms of Bergson, I just wanted to pick up on something that he talked about that I think helps us to tease out what, why we're criti why, how we can be critical of this or how we can think carefully about how this new form of knowledge, whether it's helpful or not. Um, and it's his point that in fact, what we're talking about, once you start to datify, once you have this concept, I think uh, we have to talk datism, which I think is, is, is something that sort of brings about this conceptualization that there can be a neutral understanding, something that's objective, objectifiable in some kind of way, um, is that each unit of measure is equal to every other unit of measure, which what I think happens when you begin to bring out the longitudinal dimension of how this looks over a period of time, which we're, again is facilitated by the new technologies, it allows us to then make subjective interpretations from that data. So it doesn't, I would argue, at this stage, unless we talk about it critically as though it's something that's part of a bigger e political economic uh, kind of shift and what that means. So that's one of the big questions that, that I continue to look at, but fantastic. And that's not really a question, it's just something I think that's been missing so far. Because I, I think that the first thing you raised, like the, the method, uh, maybe not a method, but that's something you actually address more explicitly, actually in your written paper that that some of us has read. The sort of uh, you 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 allude to artistic practice. I mean, you give examples of artists who sort of propose a different kind of engagement, and I know you also have a practice. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So I think that's. I mean, is that is that a sort of a way of sort of understanding this? gaze on, on us? <laughs> I think art is one of the best places to look to see how, um, you know, critiques of this, and there's so much interesting th stuff happening in the, in the, in the art world, um, critiquing exactly this sort of criti um, technology, but also, like the example with Rodin's critique of um, the photography, often, um, I'm, I, um, I, I think, Art is such a different way of portraying or seeing the world than this, which is trying to be so objective that it provides a really interesting alternative viewpoint. At the same time, as every time you look at some quantified thing, some artist has already done it. I mean, it's astounding. Like, um, okay, one of the silliest sort of quantified self things I saw recently was on Quick Starter. Is a, it's a fart monitor. Um, you clip it in your back pocket and... <laughs> and it measures your gaseous emissions and it... Um, <laughs> And you, uh, and then you, uh, um, you also enter what you eat and so forth, and it tracks your activity, and then it gives you an analysis saying how to reduce um, gas for you personalized. Um, it didn't actually get funded, um, but if you, and that was like two years ago. But like uh, I think about five, maybe ten years ago, Ellie Harrison, an artist, did that. She tracked her farts for a year, and she made a. I think it's, it's a Birmingham railway station. Um, there's one of those little borders on the glass windows there that just looks like some random decoration, but it's actually <laughs> a, a graph of her farts. Um, <laughs> and Beckett wrote about that in Malloy. Malloy um, counts his farts. I mean, so so in this case, you know, art has predicted <laughs> and critiqued well a failed quantified self um, thing a long time ago. So absolutely, look at art. Um, uh, yeah, um, kind of trying to reconnect to, to, to the question comment. So, in, in terms of methods, um, I think what I think we, we are kind of we will always be in a dead end as long as we try to 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 measure different things or to think about different units of measurement. So, what I what I, uh, I, I I'm thinking about is mostly. Um, 
imagining different, really uh, quite literally different words to be used to talk about what we do with our quantified selves, um, different, uh, different narratives, different stories, and that's exactly what artists do, so I agree with that. Uh, so um, there are many examples of uh, new media artists who are currently engaging with with, uh, with quantified self technologies and gamification, and uh, uh, what they are ultimately proposing is essentially different ways of of making sense of what do we really do. And very often uh, the the move is as as I did really is to focus on the personal intimate story of uh, how a singular individual engages with these with these technologies. Uh, I guess this is probably a move to somehow counter this uh, generalized universal narratives on quant the quantified self. Um, and it's also, of course, a, a method to, to, to say something different and probably also to escape from an otherwise um, uh, uh, strangling end of, of, of the quantified self. Hi, and um, thanks. They were great papers. Really enjoyed them. Um, I just pick up on something that the discussion just started with, uh, in realities. And I think, it, to some degree, I think it's really important, the realities of all this. And Paolo, you said, you know, my phone knows more about me than I do. It doesn't. It just collects the information. It doesn't know about you, you know. So but bring it back to the two talks. It's like, um, in yours particularly, Jill, what really struck me, particularly with the diaries and also uh, the discussion of Isa, is it's therapy. You know, people are using these things as therapy. And we had a discussion last night, we were talking about, there was a Guardian article a while ago about this woman who was on a forum, a health forum, and she was posing as a cancer sufferer, and she wasn't, and she was enjoying the kind of adulation and the support she was getting through it. And I'm just wondering about therapy, and, and for you, Paolo, the intuition, you know, I, I thought that would, you, you briefly touched upon it, and I thought that was a really interesting thing. And, you know, what was it about the, you know, say your, your, um, the, fit, uh, the fit band, the, the night fuel, that, uh, what, what intuition there suddenly went, oh, hold on, the time zones are different, it's over. It's finished. It's it's coming to an end. Uh, yeah, just interested in in that kind of aspect of it. Uh, yeah, actually, it's interesting that the the, the technical fault that the Nike Fuel had was related to the moving between time zones. Because in the end, the problem that I, that I had with Nike Fuel it was all about time and the timing of uh, my tracking, and how it was not changing in uh, in quality over time. So I in a sense, it's. Um, uh, um, the, 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 the story of my engagement with Nike Fuel and the failure of it and the end of it, it's, uh, it's all about time. But it's also uh, my, my consideration of, of breaking up with Nike Fuel, as I say, was, to, was also uh, about introducing the problem of time into, into my understanding of uh, uh, time and change, of course, and movement in, in my understanding of, of my engagement with Nike Fuel. Um, so yeah, so that was my 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 take. Uh, I think the issue of duration it's it's quite crucial, and um, and also which connects to the idea of of the event. So is it possible to imagine an event happening in these relationships that we have with the, with our quantified selves, or are they kind of somehow con condemned to remain static and always repeating themselves according to the same criteria? So how can event happen? in this engagement. I think, for example, the idea of the Dear Diary that you, that you mentioned, it's, it's quite interesting because um, it, it brings to a, to a different kind of, uh, of, uh, of connection, of, of, of uh, making sense of the relationship in the Dear Diary. This connection is always already, already there. Um, and in particular, I think with, my, with Nike Fuel, uh, what I realized at one point that it was almost impossible to tell when was a good time to stop using it. Because if it is always the same, so you can always go on for one more day, right? So you can always accumulate, you can always do plus one. Uh, so when, wh how do we decide when we stop using these self-tracking technologies? Actually, I would be very interested, I'm not sure if it has been done so far, but uh, hearing some interviews of people who stopped using these technologies. And maybe they didn't necessarily make sense, N nothing particularly drastic happened. But how do we make sense of the decision of stepping back and, and stop this continuous and repetitive uh, and homogeneous tracking of ourself, which would be a way of introducing the event and the issue of time uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the ways in which we make sense of, of quantified self?
That would be a great study. Mm. Philippe Lejeune wrote an article. He's like the great scholar of diaries. He wrote an article about how diaries end, which is kind of fascinating. He has like four types. I can't remember them all. One is obviously death, right? Yeah. <laughs> One is that somebody finds the diary who really shouldn't have, and that there are a few others. But, but it's a really interesting question. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent question. Okay. Well, I suggest that we stop uh, the panel here. Thank you so much for all the...